Good philosophy must exist, if for no other reason, because bad philosophy needs to be answered. This is Pints with Jack, Season 5, Episode 66, Philosopher and Guide, After Hours with Dr. Peter Kraft. Good morning, everyone. Pints with Jack is your weekly C.S. Lewis podcast, where Andrew, Matt and I break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. We're now in the home stretch of season five, wrapping up the season with a few interviews, and today I'm speaking to Dr. Peter Kraft. Today's episode was originally going to be a different guest, but our guest fell through, and so this interview was originally going to be published in season six. So you lucky things, you get it an entire season early. I would hope that if you're listening to this podcast, that you are already quite familiar with Dr. Kraft. But if you're not, we've got a real treat for you today, because he is a wonderful speaker, an amazing author of an obscene number of books, and his books are on all the topics that we love, on C.S. Lewis, Tolkien, philosophy, prayer, St. Thomas Aquinas, St. Augustine. He is just incredible. And I've heard British people say that Peter Kraft is the American C.S. Lewis, but I've also heard Americans say that C.S. Lewis was the British Peter Kraft. <laughs> now, I've already given something of an introduction, but to keep with the episode format, let me just give a few points of biographical information. Dr. Peter Kraft is a professor of philosophy at Boston College. He loves all his grandchildren, as well as his four children, his one wife, his one cat, and his one god. He's a well-known speaker and author of many books, including The Philosophy of Tolkien, How to Destroy Western Civilization, Prayer for Beginners, C.S. Lewis for the Third Millennium, and Jesus Shock. Dr. Kraft, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Well, I am enjoying currently a nice glass of VAT69. Uh, what exactly is VAT69? Ah, well, I have an email from Walter Hooper, C.S. Lewis's secretary, who said that Lewis once sent him out to buy a bottle of VAT69, and it was typically the whiskey that they had in the house. Ah, regular whiskey or single, not single malt? That's not a single malt name. No, it's a blend. Ah. Well, I've, I've, I've become attached to the single malt. Oh, me too. I, I drink this one much more for uh, literary reasons than anything else. <laughs> oh, it, uh, it makes you literate, does it? Um, I, I, maybe if I drink more of it, I, I don't know. I haven't tested its limits. You know, that's, that's the solution to the literacy problem in our school. <laughs> we can teach keep people to, uh, to be literate simply by drinking about 69. I, I think you're onto something there. <laughs> we always toast a Patreon supporter or a group of supporters. And today I would just like to toast all of those listeners who over the years have incessantly requested to have you on the show. So to all of those persevering saints, cheers. Cheers to you. Well, you can't be sure this is me. It might be my evil twin brother. <laughs> well, I can't also be really sure that the world exists outside of my own mind, so I, I'm just going to have to take that one on faith. Well, I'm pretty sure of that. If it doesn't, why is it making so much noise? <laughs> <laughs> this is true. If I could control everything, it would be probably better. Well, let's, uh, let's begin with a very basic and important question. How do you pronounce your last name? Because I have heard every possible permutation. I've heard Kreft, Kreft, Kraft, and Kreft. Which is it? Any way you like. The correct is Kreft. It's Dutch. It means lobster. Uh, to Englishize it is to, is to say Kreft. Um, since my first name, Peter, means rock, I am a rock lobster, so I am edible. <laughs> So I do not accept invitations from cannibals. <laughs> wonderful. Okay, I'm glad we cleared that up, and I never knew it meant lobster. That's wonderful. Well, the first time I heard you speak was in D.C. I think it must have been about 15 years ago. It was at the Catholic Information Center. And the main thing that I remember about it is the number of jokes you told. And I will say most of those jokes were chiefly about flatulence. Hmm. And we were in a chapel at the time, so I thought you were terribly brave. Uh, so to begin, what's the best joke you've heard recently? 
Well, the explanation for your observation is probably that I was born uh, and brought up Protestant, uh, and therefore uh, find myself in the company of Luther, who's famous for uh, flatulence and fart jokes. Mm -hmm. Uh, My favorite joke, oh my goodness. Uh, The one that comes to mind is my favorite lawyer joke, which is the only lawyer joke ever told to me by a lawyer. It comes from Mary Ann Glendon, who's my favorite lawyer. The devil walks into a lawyer's office and the lawyer says politely, what can I do for you, sir? And the devil says, no, it's what I can do for you. I can make you richer than Bill Gates, more famous than Alan Dershowitz. All you have to do is sign this little contract uh, giving me rights to your eternal soul and that of your wife and children and grandchildren down through 30 generations. The lawyer narrows his eyes suspiciously, takes the contract, looks very carefully at every single line, hands it back to the uh, devil and says, I don't get it. What's the catch? (laughs) <laughs> that's terrible i love it <laughs> when i found out that you were going to come on the show i told all of our listeners and i always invite them to send in questions if they have a particular question for my guests and good love questions they just poured in for you great and i'd like to begin with surfing because it's well known that you're a keen surfer and so the question was what is it that you love about surfing and what have been some of your favorite places in the world to surf? Well, I don't know that much about other places in the world. My local place is Narragansett Beach in Rhode Island, which has the best waves in New England. Uh, What's thrilling about surfing is that I think it is a kind of a preparation for heaven because we are to surf in this life on the will of God known by faith. And uh, in the next life, this will be known by experience. So the great thing that carries you in wonderful and unpredictable and powerful ways uh, is either a wave of water or a wave of God's will. They're analogical. Mm. Do you have any other favorite pleasures in life which speak to you in the same way that surfing does? It's not usually a place that pleases me. It's it's an activity. I like to play chess and ping pong and um, love to just sit in the sun uh, even without surf. <laughs> Everybody has everybody has small pleasures, and God gives them to us as remote appetizers for heaven, because heaven will lack no joy. Mm. When I lived in San Diego and would surf, my favorite part was actually just sitting astride the board between the waves when there was a little lull mm-hmm. and just enjoying the bobbing. It was it was also f- yeah. far less dangerous, and I was less likely to have my face pushed into the sand. <laughs> yes, yes, and a little more like life in the womb too. There was bobbing there, but not waves. <laughs> Some of our listeners asked about your spiritual life, and I suppose the chief question that was asked among them was, how do you pray? Badly. (laughs) Uh, I have ADD, so I get distracted very easily uh, and have a a small attention span. Uh, So I love the rosary because that gives me something to do, and uh, there's no better prayer, so uh, infinite repetition is not uh, wrong. Uh, I was very pleased to re- uh, discover that uh, that was also Pope John Paul II's favorite prayer. Mm-hmm. So I like simple prayers. I like to pray the Lord's Prayer in and sort of festoon it like a Christmas tree, because everything is in there. Thomas Aquinas says somewhere that uh, the only three things we need to know are the object of faith, hope, and love, and the object of faith is summarized in the Creed, and the object of hope in the Lord's Prayer and the object of love in the Ten Commandments. So those are the only three things we need to know. It's all in there. I think I'm like you in that regard, in terms of I'm very easily distracted. And when I pray the rosary, I actually typically do it walking. Yes. Uh, So I've got even more stuff to do. (laughs) Yes, yes. It's compatible with so many wonderful things. And you also wrote a book. I think it's probably my favorite book that you've written, Prayer for Beginners. And what I love about that is it is it just walks you through it very slowly. You're not, you're not trying to jump straight up to the third heaven. Well, most of the wisdom in that book comes from uh, one of my favorite uh, books from spiritual masters. He's not been canonized. Brother Lawrence has practiced the presence of God. Mm, yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful book. Uh, that's, that's, that's the essence of it. No matter how well you pray, if it's not in God's presence, it's not really prayer. And no matter how badly you pray, if it is in his presence, it is prayer. Yeah. 
uh, as the father of a one-year-old child, particularly when I'm going to, to mass, uh, I, I do take a lot of solace in the fact that turning up is, is a large part of what I'm trying to give uh, and just yep. tr- trying to focus as my son is trying to eat the various hymnals or play with the other people around him. <laughs> just showing up. Yes, that's what we can do at someone's deathbed too. Hmm. Woody Allen, who is uh, uh, known more for his jokes and his movies than his spirituality, uh, has said some wise things. And one of them is the most important part of life is just showing up. Didn't he also say that he wouldn't want to be part of any club that would have him? That was uh, Rowdy Dangerfield. Ah, okay. All right. This next question, this is quite a controversial one. Uh, The sport of baseball is boring. What can you say to change my mind? It isn't. You're the one who's bored. Uh, uh, baseball is very much like uh, like life. Uh, there's an article by, um, oh, what's his name? The um, conservative philosopher who just passed away a few years ago. Uh, it's called Take Me Out to the Liturgy. He proves point by point that baseball is very much like life. The whole point of it is to get home, not to make errors, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, it, it's a liturgy. Many people are bored by the liturgy because they don't fully understand it. The difference, though, is that baseball games, you get to watch this liturgy while drinking beer. Or anything else that you like. An idea for people doing church planting. (laughs) Yes. The one one thing you don't do uh, and you don't bring to a baseball game are uh, uh, clocks and phones and screens. Hmm. It insulates you. It, It is its own world. Uh, in that sense, it's like surfing. It's a kind of escape from ordinary life. Mm. Yeah, a different kind of time is operating. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with escapism. The only people who hate escapism are jailers. <laughs> oh, we're going to be talking about Tolkien in a bit. <laughs> yeah. Now, you've been a professor at Boston College for a long time. But what have you learned from your time there? Well, two contradictory things uh, spring to mind immediately. Uh, I interpret your question to mean, what have I learned from my students? And the two things I've learned is that uh, uh, the same old errors recur again and again, and that uh, the devil is very clever in masking these new things as, as uh, these old things as new things. Students and teachers, too, can be very creative in finding ways to sin uh, or to err or to goof. Hmm. And you spent your time at Boston teaching philosophy. Mm-hmm. I wasn't exposed to any kind of philosophy until I was a good deal older and starting to take my faith seriously. What actually? Well, that's because is... you're Australian, right? <laughs> I'm English. You can't get philosophy in Australia anywhere except in, in uh, seminaries, I, I hear. <laughs> well, I'm English. You, you certainly get philosophy in uh, pubs, but uh, that's just about it. Oh, where, where did you get the rather Australian accent if you're English? <laughs> I'm living in America for long enough. It's, it's warped the way, the way that I speak words now. Uh, Every time I speak to my mother, she tells me that I'm, I'm sounding more American, which makes me sad. It shouldn't make you sad. There are worse things than being American. True, but there are also better things. <laughs> uh, as we're raising my son, I'm going to make him grow up on Peppa Pig so he speaks properly. At least we don't look down on you as you look down on us. True, but if an Englishman doesn't have a smug sense of superiority, what does he have? Only about a thousand years of glorious history. True. Um, And not all of it was glorious, but good point. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, what actually is philosophy? How would you even try and explain what it is you're doing? Because I actually just started reading The Republic, and it just seems to, you know, you could just describe this as people talking about stuff, because it seems to cover everything. Well, that's almost what Socrates meant by philosophy, people talking about stuff that's important. Uh, and to talk about it is not just an act of the mind, but an act of the will. You will to talk about it. And the object of the will is what the will wants or loves. So philosophy is a kind of love. And talking is a way to express and seek for wisdom. So philosophy is literally the love of wisdom, which is pretty much like talking about stuff. <laughs> I like it. Now, one of our listeners asked, is there actually such a thing as a Christian philosophy, or are there just Christians who do philosophy? There is a Christian philosophy. Um, Descartes was a Christian, and he did philosophy, but his philosophy is not a Christian philosophy. There's not an influence, uh, a mutual influence between faith and reason. 
I think it was John Paul II that described faith and reason as two wings of the same bird. Mm. And presumably a bird could fly on one wing, but not very well. Mostly in circles. It works much better if you flap both of them. (laughs) And you wrote a book called The Greatest Philosopher Who Ever Lived. Mm -hmm. For those who haven't read it, who is it? Well, maybe I shouldn't answer that question because that's an intriguing way of getting people to read the book. But I will anyway, since you asked. (laughs) It's Mary. And I go through the basic questions of philosophy, of uh, method and metaphysics and epistemology and anthropology and ethics and politics, and find that in the few words that we have from her in the Bible, uh, you have the wisest possible answer to all those questions. Hmm. My dad was a salesman, and his big brag was that he had traveled to more countries than his age. And I heard that you had, at least at some point, written more books than your age. So was that true? Is that still true? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've lost count. It's something like 100 now. Oh, that's crazy. Well, uh, I'm actually struggling to write my first book right now. So how have you actually managed to output so much? I have no idea. I do know that I've never met uh, anybody who didn't have one very significant talent and one very significant deficit. There's always somebody that you can look uh, up to and uh, learn from, and there's always somebody that you can down on and and help. And that's true of everything in life, I think. So uh, I just write a lot of books. Can't do much else. Uh, I'm astonishingly uh, bad at computers and anything that has to do with mathematics. Uh, And the typical absent-minded professor, I, uh, I forget things. And uh, if it's practical, it's, uh, to me, impractical. But I'm pretty good at writing, I think. Speaking of technology, one of our listeners asked whether or not you still just have a flip phone. And just for context, even my mother now has a smartphone. They intimidate me. They're smarter than I am, and they trick me. Uh, They're very clever. They're not machines. Machines are predictable and controllable. (laughs) Uh, To me, computers are neither predictable nor controllable. They're coming up always with creative and new and original ways to flummox me. Speaking as a software engineer, that is definitely very true. (laughs) Well, a software engineer, I, I keep asking people in the computer industry the same question. Let me ask you this. Have you ever known the following event ever to have happened at any time and place in the history of human civilization? The event is this. Somebody once clicked on the help icon and actually got help. (laughs) Uh, Not really. Not really. That's the answer everybody gives, yes. Particularly today. You just Google it instead. (laughs) Well, one of of the uh, little aphorisms I used to say when I was just starting my career is, if software was hard to write, it should be hard to use. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Computers are wonderfully good at making uh, difficult things uh, easy, but they're equally good at making easy things difficult. Exactly. Yes. If you it, it, you can get an awful lot done in a morning, but you can also waste an entire morning trying to do something very simple. Well, I I, I got a different computer from Boston College once, uh, and I spent a whole weekend trying to turn it on, and uh, I failed. They 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 put the manual inside the computer, so they put you in a catch twenty two. Until you unless you can use the computer, you can't use the computer. It's like the title of the book, How to Read a Book. If you know how to read a book, it's useless. And if you don't know how to read a book, it's also useless. But that is a very good book, by the way. That is a real book, yes. I wish there was a book entitled How to, how to Use a Computer, which was as clear as how to read a book is about books. Yeah, I think it's available online. <laughs> it probably is, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, so you've written over 100 books. Out of those ones, which are you most proud of? Uh, Jesus shock, I think, mm. because if you ask me if I could make everyone in the world read at gunpoint any one of my books, what would that be? Well, that's the one. It's not necessarily the best written book, but uh, it's about the most important thing. And if somebody's got a gun to your face, you need to find out about Jesus pretty quickly. Well, yeah, <laughs> you can. You don't have to pin that to the gun analogy. <laughs> uh, you could say if if you truly love somebody and you want to give them a present, what's what's the best thing you can do? Hmm. Uh, and somehow you can bring him closer to the meaning of life, so close that you can eat it every day hmm. at mass. The very idea that the name of Jesus itself is shocking, that 
you just mention the name Jesus at a cocktail party, it's going to draw some reactions out of people. And there isn't another person mm -hmm. in the world for whom that is true. Yep, yep. He predicted that. He came to divide the world. In fact, one of the uh, very clever successes of a devil is to make the word divisive uh, almost synonymous with the word evil. Worst thing in the world to be is divisive today. One of your other books was Before I Go. I think you wrote it back in 2007. Mm -hmm. And the subtitle is Letters to Our Children About What Really Matters. We're now more than 13 years later. I can't apparently do math in my show notes. Uh, uh, but we're, we're over a decade later. Is there anything that you would add or change in the life that you've lived since writing that book? I don't know. I'd have to think about that. I have this habit of preferring thinking before I talk. It takes the fun out of things if you do that. I don't usually obey that habit, but I think that's a good one. I don't know. Well, I'm the father of a one-year-old. What would you say is the most important thing I need to teach my son? You're already teaching yourself something by having that teacher. Uh, the best education you can possibly have is to marry and have children. Oh, that's definitely true. And they teach you more than you can teach them. <laughs> As I was reading that book, I was wondering about your, your own parents and your own father. What were they like? Well, my father was an honorable man and a good man. And uh, he never went to college, but he was self-educated. And he worked himself up to chief engineer of a large uh, machine company. Uh, and he was a self-starter, a self-learner. At the age of, I think, 80, he began to teach himself Greek so he could understand the New Testament better. Wow. He was um, um, a man of the old world, you know, a, a sense of, of, of simplicity. Right is right and wrong is wrong. Uh, and uh, basic charity. I never had the slightest doubt that he would uh, do everything he possibly could for me. Hmm. And my mother was rather similar, uh, also not very educated, but uh, uh, a woman who would give herself to whoever needed her at, at will. So I got a great sense of security and being loved from my parents, although they were both uh, coming from the old country, a bit stoical and non-demonstrative. <laughs> but I think that's much less important than we think it is. As somebody who is by and large not particularly demonstrative, I find that encouraging. And they both raised you Christian. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were a former Calvinist and you're now a Catholic. Yep. Uh, and yet much like Lewis, and we will get onto him shortly, you seem to garner very good will from Catholic and Protestant alike. Why do you think that is? How do you do it? How do I do what exactly? Garner such goodwill from Catholics and Protestants. I have yet to meet a Protestant that you know, hasn't read your books and loved them. Well, I guess because I focus on what we have in common, which is uh, our, our faith and hope and love in Christ as the, uh, the whole meaning of life uh, and, and the source of, of truth and goodness and joy. Uh, and that's the center of everything. So if they're not living at the center of the circle, whether they're Catholic or Protestants, they don't understand me or love me. And if they do, they do. Not that the other issues are not important, but they're important because of that. The primary reason I'm a Catholic is it makes me a better Christian. It brings me closer to Christ. And one of your books is about what Catholics and Protestants can learn from each other. And for those listening, they'll fall into one of those two camps. What would you say is the chief thing that a Catholic needs to learn about a Protestant? And what do you think a Protestant should learn from a Catholic? Well, to use a single image for both questions, uh, the church is like a, a large building. And uh, Protestantism is like its uh, foundation or its cellar. And it's easy to get lost in the upper stories of a large building and forget the basement. And it's also easy to uh, simply live in the basement and forget the upper stories. I like it. It's like the house analogy from mere Christianity, but done vertically. That's a, an amazing book. That has done more for ecumenism than any other book ever written, I think. I, I think so. I, I, I never met a believing Catholic or a believing Protestant who didn't like that book. Yeah, I've heard a few criticisms, I would say mostly from Catholics, saying, oh, he doesn't go far enough. But, you know, if you want to learn about that, there are other books, like More Christianity by uh, Father Dwight Longenecker. Mm -hmm. But yes, it's we constantly argue about which is Lewis's best book on the podcast. And while we each have our arguments, just in terms of pure good that it's done the world, I think Mere Christianity has to be up, right up there. It has to be, yes. 
literarily, I think the Chronicles of Narnia will last the longest. Yeah. Because they're the best children's stories ever written. <laughs> Uh, and the only time Jesus Christ has ever been compellingly presented as a fictional literary character mm -hmm. without embarrassment. All the other Jesus novels are bad. <laughs> but this is this is about Jesus as a lion, not a man, and in Narnia, not Earth. So in a sense, he made it easier for himself. Well, let's let's transition to the related question then. Which do you think is his best book? Till We Have Faces. I knew you were going to say He that. himself thought that was his best <laughs> book. Uh, most people, when they read it the first time, don't quite get it. That's me. They don't quite understand what he's doing, and they don't quite understand why it's great. And almost always, if they give it a second, third reading, they come to that knowledge. It's a profound book about the problem of evil, the problem of, of suffering. And I'd also say the, the problem of hiddenness, which is obviously a yes. subset of that. Yes. Why must holy places be dark places? That's its, its fundamental question. So it's the relation between faith and reason. Why Why is faith through a glass darkly? Uh, if God could make things clearer, why doesn't he? he? He could zap any of us into the beatific vision right now. Why doesn't he do it? That's a good question. Hmm. How honest do you think Orwell is in that book? How much of her self-deception do you think is conscious? Because this is another argument that we've had about. In a non-profound and non-spiritual and merely psychological sense, she is a hero of honesty or a heroine of honesty. But in a deeper sense, in which honesty means uncovering yourself before God and telling yourself the truth and not deceiving yourself, she is fundamentally dishonest. Hmm. I like that distinction. So she's both very honest and very dishonest. That's her fundamental problem. Her fundamental problem is not she's not good. She's good, but she's not totally honest. Her, her mind had to be turned around. Mm. Not just her clever mind, but her self-knowing mind. Yeah. And once she could know herself, then she could know the gods and perhaps God, capital G. They always come together. Augustine frequently says this. For instance, in his, uh, uh, his little dialogues with God, he has God ask him a question. Augustine, what do you want to know? And Augustine says, only two things. God says, only two things? Uh, and Augustine says, yes. Uh, and what two things are they? Well, I want to know who I am, and I want to know who you are. Mm. And that's the two passions that drive Augustine. And, and they're together, because to know yourself is to know the image of God, and thus, thus to know God. When Lewis signed the copy of The Great Divorce to his who would, lady who would become his wife, he wrote in the front that there are three images that I must constantly destroy and rebuild. And that's the image of myself, my neighbor, and God. Hmm. This is also why I love a grief observed. It's about destroying those three uh, images and simply referring the hard truth of the real world to uh, whatever images we create in our own mind. That's the fundamental meaning of honesty, I think. Hmm. Getting out of the way and letting reality get into you. <laughs> Uh, Professor Jerry Root, he always says, uh, reality is iconoclastic. Yep. Just has this habit of, of of smashing our idols. This is also why I love Socrates. He's good at that iconoclasm without being a skeptic. Hmm. But probably an annoying person to have to dinner at times. I think Jesus would be too. <laughs> I mean, if he's not at least annoying, you're not going to nail him to a cross. Yes, yeah. Well, we've already started talking about Lewis. Um, now, during our interviews on the show, when I ask people how they came to discover him, your name sometimes comes up. Uh, but how did you discover him? I was assigned in college, The Problem of Pain. And uh, it was the first book I ever read in my life in which two things became very clear. Number one, I did not fully understand this book. <laughs> Number two, I was certain that all the fault was on my side, not on the author's. He came across as utterly clear, and I came across as unclear. And it was usually the other way around when I read books that I didn't like. Mm. So upon second and third reading, it became clearer. And I must have read the book at least a dozen times, and it becomes clearer every single time I read it. It's a book of many, many layers. It's the best book on the problem of evil I've ever read. Now, there are some interesting things about Lewis when it comes to the problem of evil, and that's he also spends some time talking about animal suffering. And that is, I don't know, I don't know just at least in the books that I've read, that is often skipped over fairly quickly. Um, he had a, a clear love for animals. 
What are your thoughts on what he says and your own thoughts about animal suffering more generally? Well, as Aristotle says, mistakes almost always come in opposite pairs. And there are some sentimental people who care more about animals than about humans. And there are also people who ignore animals like Descartes, whose dualism makes no room for them. Everything is either a machine or a a spirit. Uh, And Lewis was fascinated with animals, uh, as, as was Aquinas, who has at least 200 different observations throughout his works about the behavior of birds, different species of birds. So Lewis was a genuine animal lover. But uh, he did not confuse humans with animals, uh, and he loved them as what they were in, in the cosmic hierarchy, something that did for the bottom side of us what angels do to the top side of us, namely filling the gaps. Hmm. If there were no animals, there'd be an enormous gap in the great chain of being, similarly if there were no angels. He was also very good at depicting angels, the Eldila in his space trilogy. But he couldn't do it in letter form. Uh, when we did the Scritic letters, we read the preface where he said that he tried writing angelic letters and he said, I just couldn't do it because they would just have to drip with heaven and I'm just not a good enough man. I think after writing the Scritic letters, uh, no, I was about to say, I thought he compensated for that by another one of his books, which was probably The Great Divorce. But that's more about the psychology of damnation then about the psychology of salvation, because only one of the of the ghosts from hell on the bus uh, is saved. Mm-hmm. No, no, I take it back. The jury will disregard the remarks of the last witness, please. <laughs> I do love The Great Divorce, though, and that actually is my favorite of all of his books. Oh, that's one of my favorites, too. That's, that's Dante's Divine Comedy brought up to date. Mm-hmm. And I, just his portrayal of Sarah Smith. And I, I remember I was reading that book the very first time I had just read through the book of Revelation for the first time. And so it's like, all right, I'm ready to go back to heaven. Let's see what Lewis thinks it looks like. And you then meet this great lady there. And uh, I I thought what I think every Catholic thinks when they start reading that section. Mm -hmm. And then even Lewis's character says, is that? And they said, oh, no, this is somebody that you've never heard of, Uh, which is is wonderful. It made me roar with laughter. But it also reminded me of, of what sanctity does to everybody, even if you're not the Theotokos. One of our listeners wrote in about your series on philosophy, Socrates' children, and he pointed out that you had a section for Chesterton, but not Lewis, and he wants to know why. Is it that you don't consider Lewis a philosopher, or was there just some other reason? In philosophy itself, as an academic discipline, I think Lewis would have been very good, but not great. Uh, He is a brilliant philosopher, wonderfully commonsensical and empathetic, but uh, he buys into the English empiricist tradition, semi-rationalist tradition. He would have been, he would have been something more like Elizabeth Anscombe, a very good analytic philosopher. Mm. He, He would not have had an outlet for his more creative talents. Now, Chesterton, who never went to university, was incredibly creative and incredibly original. Uh, Lewis is not so much original as as wonderfully clear in presenting traditional truths. Uh, original in his in his style and in his method, but not so much in his content. Hmm. Uh, Chesterton is much more revolutionary. He turns you on your head all the time <laughs> because you're usually upside down, so he's turning your right side up. Right. Well, my wife runs Pints with Chesterton, a sister podcast, and she wants me to ask you what you think Chesterton's main contribution to the world has been. Everything. Uh, Hilaire Belloc once wrote a book with the title On Everything. Uh, Belloc was so close to Chesterton that I think he was trying to imitate Chesterton there. Mm -hmm. But here, in just one single book, I think his masterpiece, Orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. What does he write about? What is Orthodoxy about? Well, it's about everything. It's about the world, yourself, the meaning of life, values. It can't be classified. On my wife's show, they just finished reading through Man Alive. And we were at the Cheston Conference a couple of months ago, and she was basically arguing that that was the narrative version of orthodoxy, because you see very, very similar ideas being expressed there. Well, I, I sort of thought that the man who was Thursday 
was more like the narrative version of orthodoxy. And funnily enough, that was what her co-host also chose. <laughs> I, th- I, th- I think that's his best fiction. And that, too, is a book that nobody gets the first reading. Well, I was just going to ask you, what do you think The Man Who Is Thursday is actually about? <laughs> it's about God. Uh, Sunday is God, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, but God as known in a certain profoundly true but limited way, uh, in the best way we can know him. Uh, you might also see it as a something like a, a version of the book of Job. Yeah. It's it's obviously about the problem of evil. And uh, in a sense, it's a justification of the ways of God demand, but it's not a rational justification. As Chester frequently pointed out at the end of the book of Job, God doesn't give Job any reasons at all, not even the reasons that he could have given. Hey, read chapter one of the book. That's what that's what I'm doing. Uh, no, he just says, uh, I'm the author of these weird things like behemoth and Leviathan. You've just got to trust me. And if the world weren't that weird, it wouldn't be so wonderful. So you've got to thank me for it. And I seem to recall, I listened to a lecture you gave about the book of Job. And I remember you saying something to the effect that God says that my servant Job has spoken well of me because he spoke to me, whereas all of Job's friends just spoke about God in the abstract. Yeah, that's not an original idea. I got that from Martin Buber, one of the greatest Jewish philosophers of modern times. Well, it actually kind of ties in with Lewis, with the analytical and experiential knowledge, the the image he gives from meditation at Toolshed. You can look at the beam of light or you can look along it. Yeah, that's a crucial distinction. That's a crucial distinction. And that's, that's what the analytic philosophers lack. In fact, even today, when there's much more communication throughout the world between various schools of philosophy, especially the British tradition and the uh, the continental tradition, still, continental philosophers sound very different than English-speaking philosophers. English-speaking philosophers are clattering computer keyboards or typewriters or, or chirping birds, whereas continental philosophers are like, oh, muttering... Uh, witches or, or, or steaming locomotives or uh, I get the impression of someone pounding pillars into the earth very heavily. That's more Germanic, I suppose, than French, but still. <laughs> well, talking about the way people sound, you've written several books where you've had C.S. Lewis's character in the story. Is it daunting trying to put words into his mouth? Well... I have to give an honest answer, and it's going to sound kind of arrogant, but uh, let me tell you a, a story. Uh, George Sayer, the author of the best biography of Lewis, Jack, uh, once came to Boston and rang me up and invited me to supper, uh, and I had supper with him. And uh, he said, how many times have you met Lewis? And I said, never. And he said, you wrote Between Heaven and Hell, didn't you? I said, yes. He said, then I don't believe you. I said, Why? He said, because that's exactly how Lewis sounded, not just how he wrote, but how his conversation sounded. I said, well, I don't know. I guess uh, his guardian angel and mine were in telepathic communication or something. <laughs> but immediately I took to Lewis. He's, he's living in the back of my mind all the time, and I'm constantly quoting from him and plagiarizing from him unconsciously. He, his dreams are even the same as my dreams. Uh, the dream of a, a giant spider, like a French ro- locomotive with all the works <laughs> on the outside. Okay, so we know, we know what scares you now. <laughs> yes. Well, one of the works where you put words into Lewis's mouth is the one you just mentioned, Between Heaven and Hell. And for listeners who haven't read it, it's where there's a conversation between Heaven and Hell of the three men who died on November 22nd, 1963 namely C.S. Lewis, JFK, and Aldous Huxley. One of our listeners asked, have there ever been any attempts or thoughts at converting that book into a stage production? Yes, twice movie companies uh, bought the rights to it and started a movie. The first didn't get beyond a script. The second got to some visuals, but I think they, uh, they petered out. Something like one out of 200 or 400 movies that start uh, are actually made. And of those, maybe one out of 100 actually gets into theaters. So I don't expect anything to come of it. Well, there was recently The Most Reluctant Convert, which uh, did really well at the cinema. Uh, Did you actually see that? Oh, yes, I saw it. Very well done. I was surprised at how good it was. Most religious movies I don't think are very good. I, I thought that was very well done. 
Well, that one had been tested for many years on the stage and they are actually working on both uh, sequels on stage and also there are two more movies that are going to be made at some point. I, I, yes, I was, I was very pleased with the, the first one of the Chronicles of Narnia and a little less pleased with the second one and very unpleased with the third <laughs> one, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, which I think is the, the most charming of the seven books, was almost insultingly done on screen. It must have been done by other people. I hear the rest of them are coming. And The Great Divorce, The Great Divorce would be a great movie. Ah, I think so too. In the right hands. I've read two scripts for that that were sent to me by friends in Hollywood, and they were both bad. Oh. And they, uh, those who commissioned them agreed, and they said, keep trying again. So maybe they're continuing to try on that. In what way were they bad? What was it that they were messing up? They thought they had to add to Lewis. They thought that Lewis was boring, and they tried to jazz it up with clever technological devices, <laughs> which were extraneous and, and irrelevant. Hmm. Bells and whistles. <laughs> It, that, that worked fairly well for the screw tape letters stage production because there's very little action in there, so you have to import some sort of bells and whistles. Sure. Uh, I don't I don't think that was that bad, but wasn't that good either. The Great Divorce could be a masterpiece if done by the right people in cinema. Yes. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine the rendition of the moment when the lizard is killed and the man transforms and the lizard becomes a yes, steed and yes, rushes into yes. heaven. Oh my goodness! Yes. If, if everyone isn't crying, yes. they're doing it wrong. <laughs> the other, the other of his novels that could work very well in cinema, I think, is Paralandra. Mm. But that too would require a, a, an, an artist and a mystic as well as a movie maker. Absolutely. Now we, we've praised Lewis a lot. What's your least favorite of his books? Hmm. Probably the Pilgrim's Regress. Yeah. Because it's too cocksure and clever <laughs> yeah it's also a little bit once you know who he's talking about then it becomes a little bit too much on the nose it's an allegory yeah. so once you get the once you solve the puzzle you don't do it again if you could be transported back in time to the eagle and child and attend one of those inklings meetings what piece of poetry or prose would you want to read aloud to the group either yours or somebody else's Ooh, i'd have to read it yes Oh, I would ask Tolkien to read some of the poems, poems in The Lord of the Rings. Uh, oh, my goodness. What would I read? I, I think I would read, in honor of the Inklings, Stephen Spender's uh, World War I wartime poem, I think continually of those who are truly great. Okay. I don't, I don't know that. I'd heard that you were, a, a, at least at one point in your life, a, a big poetry fan and aspiring poet. What, what's so great about that one? Uh, Lewis could have written it. It uses stock responses or traditional imagery or Jungian archetypes hmm. for heroes. And it's a celebration of, of heroes. And after that disastrous First World War, we have very, very few heroes. Yeah. Which means that we're, we're flaccid. We're Laodicean. <laughs> we're not terribly wicked, but we're not terribly good. We're a dish rag. Hmm. We actually had a poetry month on the show last month, yeah, at the time of recording. Uh, but we had a poetry month, and I actually read Lewis's poetry for the first time. And I'd had lots of warnings from people saying it wasn't that good. I absolutely loved it. And some of it's really, really funny, like the poem about mm -hmm. Noah and his sons and how the unicorn misses the boat, effectively, and <laughs> yes. we have his yes, sons to blame. Yeah, that's very cute. I think Lewis is a very good poet, but uh, he's unfashionable because he's, you know, traditional. Mm. Uh, let me amend my latest remark. I think an even better poem I would like to hear one of the Inklings recite is uh, Lepanto, Chesterton's masterpiece. Ah, uh, yes. That that sings. That sounds almost like Augustine's Confessions in Latin. <laughs> uh, and listeners, I'll have links in the show notes to uh, both of those poems, so you can go and have a good read yourself if you, like myself, hadn't actually come across them all before. You have to read it aloud. It, 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 the sound is almost as important as the meaning. Hmm. I think that's actually a general rule for poetry. If you're not reading it out loud, I don't think you're really reading it. And you don't tend to notice things that you would otherwise. It was only when I first started reading Tolkien out loud, I discovered all this alliteration. That's less true as poetry gets more contemporary. True. But I also think poetry generally gets 
gets worse as the more contemporaneous it becomes, uh, unless it's following an older form. Oh, I quite agree. So next season, season six, we are going to be reading the first of Lewis's Ransom trilogy, Out of the Silent Planet. What advice do you have for us? None. Just read it. Just let it work its magic on you. Come with no prejudices, no expectations. Uh, be a vacuum cleaner, suck up all the dust, <laughs> and see what it tastes like. Be like a little child. You can't. One of Lewis's basic principles of, of literary criticism is you have no right to judge whether a book has uh, literary magic that it can work on you, whether it has that spiritual power, until you assume that it has and you've given it a chance by reading it receptively. Hmm. And it may be a waste of time, but it's the only way to do it. Yeah. When I first read Out of the Silent Planet, I just heard that it was a sci-fi trilogy. So as I turned to page one, I had visions of Star Trek and Star Wars in my head. That was the wrong idea. <laughs> Yeah, and he will soon dispel you of that idea. And if you like his alternative, which is more creative and, and subtler, fine. And if you don't, um, well, maybe you can learn to like it, but that's going to be a long process. Hmm. Let's talk about Lewis's marriage, because I've, I've heard you speak about it briefly on, on a couple of occasions. How do you think Joy Davidman changed Lewis? Well, look at two of his fictional characters. Look at Jane in That Hideous Strength, mm -hmm. and then look at Oriwell until we have faces. Yeah. An astonishing change. Uh, Jane is, is a kind of stereotype. Not that badly done, but not that creative. And Lewis was a bachelor, and he was not uh, uh, a male chauvinist pig, but he didn't know women that well. Uh, somebody uh, Somebody told me it was Edmund Wilson, uh, who was very critical of Lewis, read the manuscript of Till We Have Faces uh, without knowing who wrote it. And he said, a woman must have written this because no man could understand a woman as well as, <laughs> as uh, this author understood Oriwell. And then it was told that it was C.S. Lewis, whom he had called a male chauvinist. He was right in the face. <laughs> yeah, my co-host, Andrew, he effectively argues for a, a, a double authorship of that book. Uh, so. My goodness. Well, uh, obviously, Joy Davidman helped him write it hmm. uh, and probably uh, corrected original manuscript mistakes that he inevitably made. I think Bardia's compliment, quote unquote, regarding Orwell about her being effectively as good as a man is an echo of something that Lewis had said to Joy. Mm -hmm. when he praised her for her manly qualities. And she snapped back, how would you like it if I praised you for your womanly qualities? <laughs> In a sense, they're both wrong, because unless you have the anima as well as the animus, you can't have a complete animus. And unless you have the animus as well as the anima, you can't have a complete animus. In other words, a, a man is at his best as a man, only when he understands a woman. And a woman is at her best as a woman only because she understands a man. That's, that's the, the interdependence that God, I think, instituted in creating his double instead of single. As a married man, I don't think I understand my wife, but that's what marriage is, right? Of course that's you the don't. Education. Of course you don't. That's what makes her so wonderful. <laughs> She's like nature. She's a mystery. <laughs> yeah, when I compare it to the, the Greek conception of man and woman and they were once attached and you're now finding your other half it's just like being married it does not feel like that it just feels like i've invited this wonderful exotic crazy thing into my life and i'm just trying to understand it yes. let's 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 talk about tolkien for a little bit uh is it true that you gave up the lord of the rings on your first reading yes and i find that a lot of people did too yeah me too <laughs> uh, they're not interested in hobbits. They're not interested in uh, the flyover states. They admire them and they like them. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't really prefer to live in Iowa rather than in Boston, even though the people in Iowa are much nicer than the people in Boston. Uh, and then you get into the story, uh, the drama, the uh, the wizards and the orcs and the elves and the dwarves. Uh, and Tolkien says in one of his letters that that's part of his deliberate strategy. The plot is like a roller coaster. It goes from comfort to discomfort, from ordinariness and security to dragon-like things. 
uh, scary things, wonderful things. Uh, and each is there to set off the other and to validate the other. Uh, the Shire works to save all of Middle Earth, including the elves, and the elves work to save the hobbits and uh, an ordinary life in the Shire. What do you think could have been done differently so that you didn't abandon Lord of the Rings the first time? Is it just that you need encouragement from friends telling you to persevere and that this is really good? Yes. Yes. And I don't usually listen very much. So uh, I don't think it was until some admired literary critic, I think it was W.H. Auden, wrote wrote a wonderful review of Lord of the Rings. I love Auden. Mm. And I said, well, if Auden likes it, I have to like it. And I gave it another (laughs) try. And then first time I finished the thing, uh, I lost uh, pretty much a whole night's sleep. And three meals. I had to get through all three volumes continuously. It was it was a, a true obsession. <laughs> I had never read anything so beautiful. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I read the Fellowship first, and that was where I stalled at the end of that. Uh, and you're forgiven. Well, there is always grace, right? But uh, yeah, no. It was it was actually when I started reading other Tolkien stuff. Somebody recommended. Leaf by Niggle, because they mm. knew that I liked The Great Divorce. And they said, oh, this is basically his version of that. Sure, yeah. And I read Leaf by Niggle, and that, that, was the, that was the fuel that sent me back to The Lord of the Rings. That's uh, unusual, because it's an allegory. Mm-hmm. And Tolkien says explicitly at the beginning of The Lord of the Rings, this is not, a, not an allegory. I cordially dislike allegory. <laughs> yes. But he wrote a very good one himself. Yeah. He had very complicated thoughts about allegory. I think he, he, he uses the word interchangeably for lots of different things. There's a more crude allegory, mm-hmm. like Leaf by Niggle or Pilgrim's Regress. And then what he does in The Lord of the Rings. My, my friend, uh, Michael Jehosky, he wrote a book. And he's got the first chapter is mostly taken up with this idea that there's a spectrum where you've got crude allegory on one end and this subtle metaphorical suggestion on the other. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, myth is the highest allegory, if you want to use the word allegory generically. Uh, it's deeply full of symbolism, Jungian archetypes, platonic forms. The best distinction between allegory and symbolism I've ever read is the first chapter of C.S. Lewis's The Allegory of Love. Which is one of his rarer books, and a lot of people have read. That, that one is still on it's on my bookcase. I have read the uh, the sections that relate to the planets, but I haven't gone back to it. He's such a wonderful writer that he can make you fascinated with things that you would otherwise find dull. Uh, in, in writing my first book, which was on Lewis, I, I read everything that he had published, including uh, the Oxford History of English Literature, excluding Grama, which he called Oh Hell, which is a scholarly work. And I had not read any of these late medieval writers, uh, and I still don't read them much, but Lewis's account of them is wonderful. Uh, similarly, a preface to Par- Paradise Lost is, I think, better than Milton himself. Wow. Well, both of those have audiobooks. I actually interviewed the audio narrator from, from the Oh Hell volume, uh, and I promised him that that is on my list to do sometime this year. <laughs> <laughs> have you been watching The Rings of Power at all? The um, new TV special, you mean? Mm-hmm. The one from Amazon. Uh, I saw about the first half hour of it, uh, because I don't have the streaming server, so I have to watch it on my computer. And I thought the visuals were stunning, but I didn't get the plot or identify that much with the characters. Yeah, that's about right. You don't need to watch any more of it. <laughs> Which is exactly what I expected. You know, the technological bells and whistles are wonderfully done. Mm. The sensitivity to the deeper spiritual issues, you might say, in a broad sense, uh, you don't expect that much of from Hollywood. Can you explain Tom Bombadil to me? Or is this just one of these things that you either get or you don't? No, no, <laughs> nobody can. Nobody can. He's he's behemoth or leviathan. Yeah, he, he just came bouncing into Tolkien's mind and therefore into his story. He's sui generis. The only answer to who is Tom Bombadil is uh, Goldberry's answer. He is. Hmm. In that sense, he's like God. Yeah. Some have claimed that he is uh, Ulmo, one of the Valar. Uh, Some have claimed that he's an allegory for Adam, unfallen Adam. I don't think either is, 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 well, maybe he's all of those. Maybe he's Father Nature. But any purely rational and semi-allegorical answer to the question is is inadequate. He's just 
there. All right, then. Final question. Would C.S. Lewis have been a Red Sox fan? Of course. Of course. He, he <laughs> as a good Christian, he, um, he roots for the underdog. And uh, until 2004, when we lost our identity and became the new evil empire, we were not only the underdog, but the uh, downtrodden underdog who, uh, for ever since 1918, when we sold Babe Ruth to the Yankees, endured uh, unbelievable bad luck. Uh, so much so that uh, it proved the existence of a divine providence, although it cast doubt on the good nature of that divine providence. I mean, the evil empire in the New York Yankees won 26 World Series while we won zero during those years. But now, like modern American Jews, we are assimilated and we've lost our identity because we won a couple of World Series in this new millennium. <laughs> so you don't have quite the same suffering to form your character. Well, this year I felt uh, much more comforted by their discomfort. Uh, they're in last place where they belong. Now we're, we know who, who we are once again. What did Tolkien call it? The long defeat? Yes, yes. I'm astonished by people who actually read The Lord of the Rings and think that it is simplistic and fairy taleish and, and overly optimistic. It's terribly pessimistic. It's not hopeless. It's not hopeless, but it's but it's utterly realistic. Good is is yeah, it's going to win, but the uh, the war is won, but the body count is horrendous. And Gandalf says, uh, "I am Gandalf the White, but black is mightier still." On the battlefield, evil will always win, but there are other areas than the battlefield. Hmm. So Tolkien would have also been a Red Sox fan. Yes, I think so. Uh, although both Lewis and Tolkien weren't that keen on any sports, including English football. Lewis would have been a surfer, though, because he loved uh, waves and he loved body surfing. You heard it here first, folks. C.S. Lewis would have been a surfer. And on that note, Dr. Craig, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're very welcome. And by the way, I wrote a book, not about Lewis, but about Einstein on the title, If Einstein Had Been a Surfer. <laughs> the point being the uh, theory of everything requires a surfer to understand it. It was my wife who bought me your book, I Surf the Four I Am. Ah, that's a missionary manifesto trying to convert everyone to the uh, happy pagan religion of surfing. <laughs> well, as we wrap up, is there anything else you'd like to advertise? If you've written a book this week, do you want to talk about that? Um, I'm working on um, an introduction to philosophy by the Socratic method in which I have Socrates argue with an ordinary person. Oh, lovely. Uh, I can't get Socrates out of my mind any more than I can get Lewis out of my mind. Well, send me links to that when it's done, and I'll make sure that we advertise it here. Okay. Thank you for your questions. They were delightful. Well, I'd like to close by thanking all of you for spending this hour with us. Thanks to our patron supporters, particularly our top tier supporters, Marvin, Joelle, Angela, Deborah One, Deborah Two, Amanda, Thomas, Anania Mouse, Bill and Joanna, Snort, Bud, Shane, John, Kevin, Brian, Kay, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Stephen, Matt, Kelly, Chris, John, James, Kate, Peter, David, and Rowdy. Please keep an eye on our social media and our website, pintsofjack.com, for more information about next season. And please join us next episode, when we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers to you.